Welcome everyone to today's Cultivating Success webinar. I'm really excited today that we have some topics that we receive a lot of questions about here at University of Idaho Extension. We're gonna be talking about rules for processing poultry and selling eggs in Idaho, and then selling prepared and processed foods, value-added products, and cottage food rules. I'm Colette DePhelps. I'm an area educator with University of Idaho Extension, and I'm joined by Lauren O'Loughlin, who is part of our Extension team in community food systems, as well as a number of presenters that I will introduce in just a moment. The Cultivating Success Program was established in 2000 by the University of Idaho Extension Program, Rural Roots, a small acreage farming nonprofit, and Washington State University. We're really excited to be able to bring you an annual webinar series. This year, we had four days of webinars covering eight topics. This is the last, session number four. The first three sessions have been recorded and are available from the Cultivating Success webpage. Just a couple of webinar tips as we move forward. As some of you may have seen, we were doing tech tech checks this morning, and oftentimes we are running into some bandwidth issues. It might be helpful to you to close all of the other programs on your computer. And if you have problems with your sound, you can always call in using the call-in number and meeting ID in the email that had the Zoom link that you logged in on today. We're asking that at any time you type questions for the speakers in the Q&A box that you find in the control bar, usually located at the bottom of your screen. If you're having any technical issues, please type into the chat. Lauren will let you know if those tech issues are on the speaker side or perhaps on your side and help you troubleshoot them. This webinar is being recorded and a slide handout will be available on the Cultivating Success website. We do know with rules and regulations that oftentimes people are a little hesitant to ask questions. When you type a question into the Q&A box, you have the option to submit that question anonymously. So if you are wanting to ask a question, but you don't want it associated with your name, that is absolutely okay. And of course, this is a non-regulatory um, webinar is educational, and we are here to help you understand and comply with the rules. So our first topic, rules for processing poultry and selling eggs in Idaho. Um, we have three people that are presenting today. We're going to start out with Charles Tyndall. He's with the USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service, actually located in Spokane, Washington. Charles is gonna be talking about poultry processing rules and exemptions that apply in Idaho. I've also included Ron Todd's email, which will be in the handouts that you receive. Ron is located in Boise. He was unable to join us this morning, but he is available to answer questions. As I mentioned, I'm Colette DePhelps with the University of Idaho Extension. I will be talking about the rules for selling eggs in Idaho. And then Jamat Locke from Pack River Farm is going to talk with us about her farm and her personal experience raising poultry and producing eggs here in North Idaho. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the slides over to Charles to share his screen and tell us about the rules for processing poultry in Idaho. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Ron Todd uh, was going to be doing the presenting today, but he had an, uh, more pressing matters to take care of. So I will be covering the USDA's uh, poultry exemptions for slaughter and processing. Uh, we do have a guidance document that you can see on the screen here. It, it was uh, it, uh, created in 2006 it, uh, because the exemptions are very much different than the exemptions for livestock animals it, and how they're handled it, uh, exemptions. Uh, 
these include beef, pork, poultry, or beef, pork, lamb, and goat. Yeah, so poultry is a little bit, well, actually quite a bit different. There's is several different exemptions that I'm going to be going over. And uh, you'll get a link to this uh, compliance guideline to go over uh, later on because uh, I probably won't be able to get to everything on here uh, because it is quite in depth, but it is a very good reference for just about any question you have as far as slaughtering, processing and selling the products and how to label them as well. <laughs> Uh, let's go. This is a flow chart. Uh, yeah, basically, yeah, uh, you basically just answer these questions and determine which one you are going to use. The big difference here yeah, between, uh, well, they all come down to one of two questions. Are you going to custom slaughter for other people or are you going to slaughter them yourself, yeah, uh, your own birds? If you raise birds or you purchase them yeah, to slaughter and you do all the slaughtering, you can sell directly to the consumer. Yeah, if you slaughter for other people, then you have it, you can only slaughter for other people. You can't sell any other uh, poultry products. You can't slaughter your own and sell them. It's they don't want any commingling of yeah, uh, the birds. Uh, also, custom slaughtered birds cannot be sold. They can only be used by the person that raised that bird. Yeah, and when I say raise that bird, yeah, uh, usually you start raising either at the yeah, by buying an egg or buying a yeah, chick or buying the yeah, uh, mature bird. Yeah, uh, but once they're slaughtered, you're not really able to raise them at that point. Uh, personal use exemption basically is straightforward. Uh, this is more yeah, uh, addressing how we look at the poultry that is custom slaughtered. Yeah, because it's basically slaughtered for that person, yeah, either by that person or by someone else. And let's see. And let's see. Now with custom slaughter, yeah, it's different with beef and pork and other livestock animals in that yeah, uh, that's all that person can do yeah, if they're slaughtering for someone else, is slaughter for someone else. And here are the criteria you have to fulfill yeah, in order to do that. Hopefully this is all making sense. Uh, producer grower 1000 limit exemption, that's 1000 birds per year. Uh, this is the most common type of uh, exemption uh, that I've seen. Yeah, uh, you don't raise more than 1000 healthy birds. Yeah in a calendar year and sell it for human food. Uh, the poultry grower does not engage in buying or selling poultry products other than those produced from poultry raised on his or her farms. Either the slaughter and processing are conducted under sanitary standards, practices, and procedures that produce poultry products that are clean, sound, fit for human food. Also known as not adulterated. Yeah, you keep yeah, production records of 
you know, when you slaughtered it, how many you slaughtered, the dates and all that. Uh, and the poultry products do not move in commerce. Basically, commerce means that you cannot sell them across state lines. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is the one that yeah, one violation I yeah, I see most often yeah, is they do everything right, but then they yeah, decide to yeah, slaughter it and process it in Idaho and then sell it yeah, in a farmer's market in Washington. Yeah, uh, so that's the biggest thing. And commerce basically means interstate travel. Uh, <clears throat> And you have to meet all five of those criteria, but with the thousand limit exemptions, they are the most lenient criteria and the easiest to meet. Uh, you know, your records include slaughter records, and, uh, sales records, yeah, uh, and it can't be more than a thousand. Gallons a year. Now you can do over a thousand, a thousand up to twenty thousand, but then you would be under the producer mm -hmm. grower exemption. Uh, obviously, they have more criteria if you fall under this exemption. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Charles, for some reason, your sound has gotten quite quiet on my side. So I'm wondering if. You can move a little closer to your mic or maybe talk just a little bit louder on your side. Yeah, I can uh, talk a little bit louder. Great, thank you. Horse today. Okay, the producer grower is yeah, 20,000 bird exemption. Uh, you have to meet these uh, at least eight criteria. No more than 20,000 poultry raised by uh, you in a calendar year. Uh, and you can't buy any other products uh, and sell them uh, uh, that were produced under other exemptions. Uh, and when you are distributing them, uh, well, basically, you will distribute the birds uh, only within your state or territory. The poultry are healthy when slaughtered. Uh, you have to slaughter them and process them on your premises. Yeah, that's another yeah, uh, violation I see yeah, sometimes is people will go to another farm to slaughter them. Yeah, you can borrow the equipment yeah, and take it back to your farm or your premises, yeah, uh, but you can't take them yeah, off your premises to slaughter them and process them. Uh, and you can't let other people use your facility to slaughter yeah, process the poultry. Uh, shipping containers. Yeah, have to be labeled. And you can sell your birds to it once they are uh, packaged and labeled. Yeah, you can sell them to another distributor that will distribute them, yeah, or you could sell them directly to hostel, hotels, restaurants, retail stores, institutions, yeah, or small enterprises. Yeah, uh, within your state. And another in note is, uh, like I said, you can rent the slaughtering or processing equipment uh, and take it back to your uh, premises to uh, do the slaughtering. It is a capital intensive process to slaughter birds. You need equipment to do that. Uh, especially if you want to do it quickly and efficiently. Yeah, uh, so yeah, uh, you might need to borrow other people's equipment yeah, to do that. Producer, grower, or other person's exemption. 
And this here is another popular one. Basically, somebody may not have the space or uh, uh, resources to grow 20,000 birds. Yeah, so we do uh, give you the opportunity to buy other people's live birds and then sell them yeah, uh, directly to household consumers, restaurants, ho yeah, hotels, and uh, institutions like boarding houses and whatnot. Uh, Uh, blocking my meeting. And we did have a, a quick question, Charles, that I wanted to address that came into the chat, and that was where you could find this document. And I did put the link to the document in the Q&A box that everyone can see. And I'm also putting it into the chat right now. So you should have the link both in the chat and in the Q&A box. Cool. Uh, so yeah, you can raise or purchase up to 20,000 poultry in a year. Yeah. Uh, and any poultry that you process is basically the same yeah, birds that you slaughtered. Uh, like before, only in-state yeah, sales and distribution. Uh, oh. And one of the overarching themes of the poultry exemption, you can only have one exemption per year. However, like say in 2023, you only raise a thousand birds, so you, you you fall under the thousand bird exemption. Starting January twenty first in in twenty twenty four, you could uh, decide that uh, you want to do uh, a producer grower and buy nineteen thousand more uh, birds. Yeah, so you don't have to be in in one for all time. It's just in that calendar year. Uh, producer, grower, or other persons uh, go to household consumers, restaurants, hotels, and boarding houses uh, uh, for institutions uh, where they sell directly to the consumer. And you always want to make sure that it's wholesome, sound, and clean, and fit for human food. Yeah, uh, Same thing, you can't use other person's property to perform the slaughter and they can't use your property to do the slaughtering on, yada, yada, yada. Uh, shipping containers, when distributed intrastate, which is in-state commerce, uh, your name, the address, your address, and the statement exempt PL 90-492. Uh, and that is PL 90-492 was the public law nine, uh, in the 90th Congress, 492nd law, uh, which also known as the Poultry Products Inspection Act. Charles, we had a couple questions that came in that I thought maybe this would be a good time to answer. The first one is, do, does the law consider quail, poultry, or game birds in terms of processing? Quail is not considered a, it is not defined as poultry currently. So here, uh, there is some question that it might be, yeah, but right now, quail is considered an FDA product. Yeah, uh, same with quail eggs, I believe. 
Yeah, uh, so that's a good question because yeah, and yeah, uh, I can probably follow up and give you what we consider poultry. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, but I believe it's chickens, turkeys, geese, ducks, rat types, which include emus and ostrich, as well as squab, which is yeah, uh, baby pigeons. Yeah, uh, there is a voluntary uh, exemption, well, voluntary inspection where somebody comes and inspects the poultry uh, for other uh, other waterfowl, like swan or crane or whatnot, if that ever becomes an option for somebody. Yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah, quail and pheasant, yeah, and those type of game birds yeah, are considered the yeah, uh, FDA regulated uh, products. Thank you. And another question, are rabbits considered under the classification of poultry or uh, are they separate? Uh, rabbits are, rabbits are one of those that is similar to quail. They are FDA regulated. However, we do have a marketing law that allows for poultry inspectors if federally, uh, or federal poultry inspectors to inspect rabbits. Can I speak to the rabbit for a minute? Sure. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we raise rabbits for meat processing and um, they're actually processed at Northwest Premium, which is a cattle and sheep processing plant. Um, they are under the voluntary inspection for us. Mm -hmm. And so we do have a USDA processor there to inspect it. Um, so as long as we had a HACCP plan, um, they were able to uh, process rabbits there. Yeah. Yeah, it, and it, normally that is uh, a, a fee is charged for that inspector to do that normally. Yeah, uh, that's the only difference yeah, with, uh, well, that's, yeah, that's the big thing that most people notice is different with rabbits is there's usually a fee for the processing. But yeah, it, uh, it's pretty easy to get inspection for rabbits. It, uh, it, you just have to apply for a grant of inspection for that it, uh, voluntary service. But it is voluntary, basically. Great, thank you. And just for a little more clarification, in Idaho, we at one time did have statute that covered poultry processing. However, that statute has been repealed. So in Idaho, we fall under these federal rules and the document that Charles has provided is the official document guiding poultry in our state. And so that's a little bit of clarification about where we are right now in terms of our processing landscape. So yeah, it, uh, I, I think we ahead. have time for maybe one or two more questions, Charles. Yeah. So one of the questions that comes to me is, so we're talking about an individual producing a thousand birds or up to 20,000 birds. So if, when you talk about an individual, can an individual be a farm business that is not, that is structured under a legal entity that is not a sole proprietor? So how does the law define what an individual is? So one person, one business? As long as they are yeah, one entity, that is doing the producing, it, uh, we usually consider that as the producer grower. Okay, great. And then a follow-up question. If there's a piece of property that has 
two separate farmers operating separate poultry operations, but on the same property. So they're legally separate businesses and the operations are not intermingled. The birds are not intermingled, but they're on the same property. Would, would they be able to each one of those farm entities be able to produce up to 20,000 birds? So for instance, if somebody owns a farm and they're producing up to 20,000 birds, but then they lease a portion of their farm to another producer who also wants to produce poultry, is that allowable because they're two separate businesses that are operating autonomously? Basically, yeah. Because they would be, you would basically have two different producer growers. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. Are there any final comments you would like to make before we move on to our next presentation? Um, yeah, one other thing is the small enterprise exemption is uh, somewhat of a catch all for somebody that wants to. Uh, do small scale processing, but uh, also wants to uh, process the birds, uh, well, basically dress and cut up the birds, uh, or if they want to buy additional poultry uh, and cut that up and sell that as well. Uh, and the criteria for that are uh, on page 13 and I believe after that. And uh, uh, that is uh, a lot of small retail stores that also want to do uh, poultry processing uh, usually fall under that. So, but uh, uh, feel free to go over this and I'm available by email for any questions uh, and I'll try to give you a, a uh, thought out uh, answer to that. Uh, here's a nice little table for you to go over. One thing, this was written in 2006, so you know, there are attachments at the end that have locations and uh, contact information. Most of those have changed, so uh, if you ever have uh, want to reach out to that particular area, uh, feel free to give me a yeah, shoot me an email and I can get you the updated list. So, and that's all I have. Yeah, yeah, but feel free to go over this in depth and shoot me any questions you have on it. And I'll be yeah, uh, ready, willing, and able to uh, shoot you an answer. Great. Thank you so much, Charles. I will make sure to put your email in the chat. And for those that are on the webinar today, we will make a copy of this webinar available with handouts. So you will have those emails in the handouts from the Cultivating Success website. So thanks so much for Charles being on today and sharing that really important information. I am going to jump in and very quickly share information on the rules for selling eggs in Idaho. So we have several different regulations that impact egg sales in Idaho. We have the Idaho Food Code, Idaho Statutes, and some regulations re that are posted on the Idaho State Department of Agriculture website. Again, these slide handouts will be available, so you will have these links and you can go directly to the different provisions of the code and state statute and to the ISD, ISDA website. So if you are an egg distributor or a producer with over 300 birds, you need to comply with the Idaho Department of Agriculture's rules for governing eggs and egg products. And this is really to protect the public interest and really make sure that eggs are produced to a certain standard. You will also need to comply with the Idaho Code for Eggs and Egg Products in Title 37, Chapter 15. So this is again, if you are an egg distributor or a producer of over 300 birds, most small producers actually fall within the rules that are governing producers that are having less than 300 birds. 
So if you have less than 300 birds, you may sell ungraded shell eggs, so eggs still in their shell, direct to consumers and to retailers. The eggs must be clean and the, con the containers must be labeled. So let's delve into what are clean eggs. According to the law, shell eggs shall be received clean and sound and may not exceed the restricted egg tolerances for US consumer grade B eggs, which means no more than 10% of the eggs that are sold in whatever packaging you're using are dirty, check eggs, or otherwise unfit for consumption. So to really understand what this US consumer grade B is, you need to go the next level and look at those rules. So when you delve into what these US standards are, you find that a dirty egg is an individual egg that has an unbroken shell with adhering dirt or foreign material, prominent stains or moderate stains, covering no more than 1 32nd of the shell surface if it's localized, so if it's a spot, or 1 16th of the shell surface if scattered. And I know this seems really vague, like what is 1 32nd or 1 16th? So what I suggest you do is that you actually get an egg and you use a Sharpie and you draw lines around the egg until you get down to see what is 1 16th, what is 1 32nd? And that's gonna help you understand at what level you actually need to move forward to clean your eggs, either using a dry cleaning or a wet cleaning method. If they're not dirty, you don't have to clean them, but you do need to clean them if they are. And this is one of the provisions that I see most often is not adhered to by very small egg producers. Often they're is dirt or other foreign material, bedding, um, sometimes even fecal matter that is adhered to the shell. And that would not be accessible under the rules. An individual egg that is a check egg has a broken shell or a crack, but its shell membranes are intact. So you know the, the membrane on the inside of the shell and it doesn't leak. So you can have a check egg, but again, that has to be less than 10% of the eggs that you're selling. So check eggs are lower in quality than dirty eggs. And I am providing the direct link to that, those eggshell standards. You also have to do proper egg handling and delivery and temperature is key in this. So eggs have, that are not treated to destroy all viable salmonella shall be stored in a refrigerated equipment that maintains an ambient air temperature of 45 degrees or less. And that is not only stored before sale, but also in transport and delivery. So shell eggs must be received by the buyer in a refrigerated equipment that maintains an ambient air temperature of 45 degrees or less. So if you are using a cooler, you need to actually have a thermometer in the cooler and you need to have ice and be cooling the inside of that cooler to 45 degrees or less and holding it at 45 degrees or less. If you're at farmer's market or even if you're transporting your eggs to a retail store or to a restaurant. Food establishments that are buying your eggs have to, in, they have to inform the consumer that the eggs are ungraded. And so in terms of a restaurant, they have the opportunity to do that on their menu, on a menu board, on table cards, or they can choose other means, but they do have to say that the eggs are ungraded. In terms of packaging, under Idaho rules and regulations, fiber egg cartons can be reused if they are clean. Plastic egg cartons cannot be reused. Styrofoam egg cartons cannot be reused. University of Idaho does not recommend that you reuse any egg cartons. And this is based on food safety. You cannot guarantee that used egg cartons are free from microbial or chemical contaminants. And so if you choose to use a reused egg carton and it is contaminated and there is a food safety issue that arises from that, you are, at, or your farm, depending on your legal structure, are liable for that risk that you introduced. So it's really important to understand where your egg cartons are going to be and understand the risk that you're assuming if you use egg cartons that are used. If you're reusing the cartons, you need to remove the prior packing information from the label blacken out all of the other dates and the other packer's name 
and contact information with a permanent marker. And then you're going to need to label them with the information that is required for you. You will want to talk to your buyers as they may require the use of new egg cartons. So even though Idaho rules allow for the reuse of fiber egg cartons, perhaps the retailer or the restaurant that you're selling to does not allow the use of reused cartons. And again, that's gonna chain back to these food potential food safety risks. So labeling egg cartons. Under the rule, you're required to put the individual's name, physical address, and zip code. You also need to have safe handling instructions. In the picture, you can see an example of the individual put their name, their address, and their zip code. And then you can see underneath that their package already had safe handling instructions. You can put those safe handling structure, instructions on your egg cartons yourself if they do not be, become pre-printed. You can easily put them on a small sticker and it needs to say to prevent illness from bacteria, keep eggs refrigerated, cook eggs until yolks are firm and cook foods containing eggs thoroughly. The third thing that you need to include on your label is the statement that your eggs are ungraded. And you may go into a store and people are selling pullet eggs at one price, or you may see this at the farmer's market, so smaller eggs at one price. They may say farm eggs are another size, jumbo eggs are another size. These are still ungraded eggs because they are not following the US standards for graded eggs. So you need to make sure that you are labeling them as ungraded, even if there's some size differentiation that you're providing as well. You can um, contact your Department of Health and Welfare to be able to get this document that you'll need to provide with your delivery to either a retailer or a restaurant. And this is essentially an ungraded shell egg exemption statement that says that you're following the rules that I've just gone over for eggs. So you may not be delivering eggs to a retailer in a carton of a dozen or 18, it might be more in a flat, but you will need to have this document accompany that delivery. There's a lot of information out on egg production and handling of eggs. This extension publication, Safety Tips for Handling Farm Fresh Eggs from University of Minnesota is an excellent resource for farmers as well as for consumers. And just a search tip when you're out there looking for information on eggs and egg safety, I suggest that you put into your search bar the topic and then .edu. That is going to bring you to research-based information from educational institutions that hold to a research-based standard. We're talking about a lot of laws today and throughout this series, and it's really important to understand that you're responsible for knowing the rules and regulations in your state, county, and municipality, and that you need to follow those requirements. There might be additional licensing that you're required to have, but again, you need to contact the appropriate agency and read, read the rules yourself so that you understand what applies to your business. Things to keep in mind that navigating the legal environment can be frustrating. These rules, sometimes you need to go the next level. If you're in the document that Charles provided, you're going to wanna click on those links and go the next level to read the rules that are being re referenced. Definitely makes a lot of sense to be patient and friendly. People are really trying to help you operate your, your farm in a successful way, as well as adhere to those rules. And we really suggest that you follow up your conversations that you have with an email, restate what you heard, ask for confirmations that your understanding is correct, and then keep a copy for your records. This is you doing your due diligence of understanding and following the rules as they're explained to you. Um, the common ground around all of these rules and regulations related to poultry and egg production is that they're really designed with food safety in mind. And we do recommend that you develop a food safety plan for your farm that includes transportation and markets and that you're documenting things like your temperature controls and consider even doing a traceability, um, like a mock recall. If somebody said, oh, I think something's wrong with this dozen eggs. Can you identify and trace where those eggs came from, when you gathered them, how you handled them so that you can show that you did that in a way that adheres to the rules as well as protects food safety.
So with that, I'm done with this short presentation about egg production. And while we're switching to our next presenter, who is going, Jamette Locke, who's gonna be talking about her experience producing eggs and pastured poultry in Idaho. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat as we transfer over to Jamette. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So uh, Lauren, can you skip to the next one? Perfect. So my name is Jeanette Locke. I am, we, are, we have a farm in Sandpoint, Idaho, and um, we've been here for about eight years. Just to kind of give you a little background about us. We um, decided on chickens because we noticed at our farmer's market the first year that we lived here that there wasn't a lot of eggs available at the market after 10 o'clock in the morning. So we decided to uh, go into chickens that way. And first year we did, first couple of years we did layers. And then we moved on to meat birds from there. And Lauren, if you wanna to go to the next one, please, thank you. So we raised a production layer, which is a, a red sex link layer. You can see a black bird in the back. And that was like, um, also a sex link, but it was a black sex link so that I could switch out my birds um, on a basic two year. So I would just change the color of the bird so that I knew which ones needed to uh, get processed and which ones were staying and, and laying. And I did have roosters. So I would allow my mamas to get broody and would have babies here on the farm. We also did different types of um, housing for our layers because we did move them around on the property. Lauren, can you go to the next one, please? So this is our, this, is, this was my favorite coop. It is built on an old hay wagon. It is open year round. And as you can see, the birds are like underneath and it, there's a lot of snow, but it's southward facing. So it allows for great airflow. I also used bark chips instead of straw for my birds um, on the bottom base of the coop. And I never lost a bird to any of my winters in, in that coop. And currently that coop is at um, the Agricultural Center in Sandpoint. So they're using it to uh, have the birds follow the sheep in their um, experiment that they're doing. Can you go to the next one, please? So there's the hay wagon, a better look of it as we were building it. And you can see how, and that particular hay wagon could hold up to 60 birds very easily. You want, you can skip to the next one. And that's another coop that we had that was mobile that is a, on an old car trailer. So we tried to use as much ventilation as possible in, in all of our coops. That particular one could hold about 150 birds on either end were roosts on the inside. And then against the two longer sides were nesting boxes. And then if we could go to the next one, please. And this is our big barn that we would use for winter. Um, and there is straw in there, but uh, shortly after I learned that straw was not the best thing to have in my, my big barn, so it went to bark chips. The one thing that we did do is on the very back, the south end of that barn, we had a heated nesting room. So that allowed for eggs not to freeze in the winter. And then we also made it so that all of our uh, roosts were on were, were had Simpson brackets on them, so I could easily pop them out and bring a tractor in and clean out that barn um, when I brought in new bark chips every every season. And that uh, black cat's my inspector. Make sure that I do everything correctly. Uh, next slide, please. So these are our labels that we used for our our. Um, egg production. Uh, when I stopped, we were doing about 250 dozen a week, so 30 dozen a day. 
and every day the eggs were dated. So as Colette was talking about traceability, I always also put the date on the back of my egg carton. So if someone could tell me the date of that egg carton, I could then pull any, I would know exactly where those eggs had gone and I could pull any of those eggs off the shelf if I needed to uh, with that particular date. We did not reuse egg cartons. Um, we would buy our egg cartons by the pallet and then hand label every single one of them. We do have the safety standards on the back. We also have our address and our phone number so that people could call us directly. And um, we did have the ungraded on there as well. Also, we were corn and soy free from chick to layer. Next slide, please. So before we move into the meat birds, because that's what this one is all about, does anybody have questions concerning the layers or how we handled that part? We did have a question that came in and that's what type of bark chips did you use? I would get the any tree service. I actually had a gentleman who didn't wanna pay the dump $65 to dump his bark chips. So he would come to our property because we had a lot of space for him and he could come at his convenience and he would just dump his bark chips. And it was all different types of trees, but we didn't seem to have any issue with our birds for that. And I loved the bark chips because the, there were little insects in there. So the birds enjoyed that and scratching around in that, but also they absorbed more moisture and didn't stay wet. So they would dry out better like straw holds so much moisture and carries mites and that causes so many issues, especially in the winter here for birds respiratory health. And so that's why uh, we did bar chips and I would just, if you could find a tree service person in your area that would be willing to just dump on your property, it's just great to have. And then you can clean it out and it comes great compost. That's great. Um, we had another question that came in to Matt, and that's why was the corn and soy free important? That uh, a lot of people have a lot of food sensitivities today. And so for us and our food health journey, we personally tried to stay away from soy. And then the more research that we did about corn and the GMO issues with that and the chemical issues with that, that's why we chose to do that. And then we found that that was a bit of a niche and became a part of our marketing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another question is, did you use bark chips in the bedding boxes? I had, I had roll away boxes. So I never used any type of straw or pine shavings or anything like that. I had the um, hen gear roll away boxes. Okay, great, thank you. And then the final question that has come in is why did you get away from selling eggs? Because <laughs> I was the only one doing it. Not everybody loves chickens. Everybody loves to eat chickens and loves to eat eggs, but not everybody loves to take care of chickens. And it just got to be a lot for me. Um, mm -hmm. Staffing was a challenge and continues to be a challenge even on our produce farm. Mm -hmm. So it just got to be too much for me to do on my own. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for answering those questions that had come in, Jeanette. Sure. So now we're gonna move on to our meat birds. And we pretty much fell under, fell, fell under the thousand bird exemption. Um, and in this particular picture, we had about 500 birds um, on a pasture at that particular time. And I'll have some better pictures of the um, structures that we used for that. And um, if we could move to the next slide, please. So the smaller tractor is a John Siskovich style tractor, and I'm sure a lot of people have 
seen this tractor before. Uh, we kind of altered it a little bit. Instead of using hardware cloth on the lower portion of the tractor, we actually used concrete lath that you find over in the concrete section of Home Depot. It helped with a lot of predators because it is sharp. So they couldn't get through because they would hurt their paws if they were trying to, to claw into it. So I didn't really lose any birds in that particular fashion. And then we also uh, purchased all of our tarps off of Tarp Plus, which allowed us to customize our tarps or if we wanted more grommets, we could do that as well. The other larger, and those smaller kits would hold about 25 birds. And then the larger tractor that you see there, it, hold about, it held about 100 birds. And it was my husband's design. It had four wheels on it. I'm about 5'4", and I could move that particular tractor by myself um, when I needed to. And we were out on pasture doing the birds. And the challenge with that is we did have hanging feeders, but we did not have hanging waterers. So I would take water out twice a day. I moved my birds on pasture twice a day and would change out their waters um, twice a day. So we move to the next slide, please. So I um, didn't raise Cornish Cross for several different reasons. One of them, uh, a little bit on the personal side, I found out that Tyson owns the patent on Cornish Cross. So I that was a personal choice of mine, but also that bird was a hybridized bird and is not able to do well on pasture. They're better in confinement. So I wanted a bird that was a little bit hardier and could handle being moved twice a day on pasture. So the red birds are a royal red. Uh, they, they pluck out really well, uh, but they're beautiful tender meat. I have to say that my favorite all time bird is an imperial gray, but as you can see, they're black and their pin feathers are black. So there are a few challenges with that when you are, if you do decide to process your own birds, um, that can be a bit, having pin, black pin feathers can, doesn't always look appealing, but the, the meat is absolutely amazing. Next slide, please. So this is our processing facility and, or was our processing facility as we don't process birds anymore. But uh, it, in an old, it's in a shipping container. So it's 40 feet long. Uh, the picture is being taken from where the double doors open. So right outside of those double doors was a concrete pad and that's where our kill cone setup was. And then we had the scalder ready to go. The plucker, we did in a, um, and then where this double sink is, is where we did our evisceration. And then the IBC tote is where we would have our ice and our ice bath to cool the birds down to the proper temperature of less than 40 degrees within that four hour period. And then what you don't see is there's a door that we had a fill room that we would drop down to 35 degrees to chill the birds to for 24 hours and then we would put them into the freezer and we would um, shrink wrap and bag the birds once they were done chilling. And there's our label that we um, had for our packaged birds. We only sold direct to consumer. And I do have to say that because we did all of our birds, no corn, no soy on our meat birds, the most meat birds take longer to grow out if there is no soy. So that can be a decision maker as well for you. Next slide, please. Uh, this particular gentleman, I think is absolutely fantastic. He has wonderful recipes in his book. I really like his uh, mineral nutritional supplement that he adds to, uh, that was added to my feed that I bought out of Airway Heights. 
and I highly recommend this book. It's very cost effective and has tons of great information in it. It's and it's not a super thick book, so you can flip through it really easily. Next slide, please. So this, I wanted to talk about marketing because really it comes a lot of it comes down to marketing and understanding your terms of your birds, how your birds are, are they on pasture, are they free range, because all of those things mean something different. And so you need to really be able to um, communicate that to your customer, um, know who your market is, who are you trying to compete with? If you're trying to compete with Walmart, it's not going to happen. You, it, they, they have too much volume for that. So you've really got to find a way to set yourself apart and help your customer understand that, especially another reason why we were, we got out of the business was at the, in 2022, I was going to have to raise my prices. My eggs were already retailing at $6 a dozen, which is a challenge for a lot of people. And I understand that. And so, and then wholesale was going to go up to 425. And again, that is a challenge for people. So we felt like in our particular demographic, we were hitting the top of our market already. And then um, just knowing your research about a, you, even your farmer's market. Does anybody else have no corn, no soy eggs? Is anybody else doing pasture-raised birds? And understanding that piece of it. And also knowing your story. Because customers want to get to know you. They want to know where their food is coming from. And being able to tell your story of why you got into what you're doing and why you love what you're doing. And... Um, you know, using social media is a great tool, takes more time. So it, I feel like also being a small business, we have so many things that are on our plate and that we have to do. Sometimes we have to uh, choose wisely in which direction we're going to go in. But do you have any questions? Thank you, Jeanette, for that was a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and all of those details. We do have a couple questions that have come in. And one question is you talked about a concrete component of your beds, or not your beds, but your um, housing for your pastured poultry. You had a question of what is that again that you named? The con oh, the tractors or the I'm not I'm not quite understanding the, but the concrete, the concrete pieces. Yeah, the concrete pieces that you said inhibited predators to oh. come in. Oh, the concrete lath, L-A-T-H-E. It's in the, it's at Home Depot. It comes in a sheet, which is almost the same length as those smaller tractors. So it's like eight feet. And it's just the right height for that space of that particular tractor. Okay. Great, thank you. Sure. Another question was, could you repeat the two breeds that you raised instead of Cornish Cross? Yes, um, there's another one and it's a white bird. It's called a Kosher King. Okay. And then there's a Royal, a Royal Red. And then my favorite one is the Imperial Gray. Okay, thank you. And then if you had to start over today in 2023, is there one thing you would advise to plan for in terms of profitability and reliability of continuance? So, you know, you explained the reasons that you decided to leave raising eggs and pastured poultry, but for farmers that are thinking about moving in to pasture poultry and really planning for their profitability and the being able to feel confident they're going to be able to continue their business. What is a, one thing you would advise them to plan for? Staffing and understanding the whole processing of the birds 
the slaughtering and um, knowing that you can handle that. I think that that was the biggest, one of the largest issues for us and our family since we did, our birds were raised on site, we processed on site, and it just became a lot um, to process that many birds. And mm -hmm. maybe, and we did 200 at a time. So uh, having your birds maybe spaced out so it's not so much to do at one time. Uh, profitability, I would highly recommend you pre sell your birds. That's one thing we didn't do. We would just, we just got our birds and we figured we'd sell them all. So pre-selling your birds ahead of time, getting your consumer excited about that bird, having pictures of the birds on pasture, things like that, especially either on your website or in a farmer's market setting. And then you know exactly when you're gonna be processing and how many you're gonna be processing on that day and that those birds are already sold and they're done and they're gone. And you don't have to worry about storage or anything like that. So I would highly recommend that as well. That is great advice. And in terms of thinking about the pricing for your boards, did you price them based on kind of a cost of production and then what, a return? We did. Okay. We, we didn't pay ourselves as well as we should have, but we did cover our costs concerning the, um, the feed and uh, what it took to get the processing center up and running and all of those things. But when it came down to our labor, we did not include that. And if you are going to be putting that much time and effort into your birds, make sure that you are getting paid yourself and paying yourself a fair wage to do that. Great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your story and that extremely important advice to people who are getting into poultry. And I would also say that if you go to the University of Idaho website, we have publications and one of those can help you look at what the costs are of producing your birds. I will include a link to that publication on the Cultivating Success website when we post the recording from this webinar. So thank you so much, Charles and Jamette, for talking to us today about poultry. And we really appreciate that. If you missed the beginning of our presentation, this has been recorded and we will post the recording and it will go into deep detail about what those exemptions are in Idaho for a thousand birds and then up to 20,000 birds. So thank you again so much. We are going to transition to our next speaker. And we are really excited to have Danelle Barrett, who is with Panhandle Health, presenting today on preparing value-added and processed foods and what our cottage foods law are. So Danelle Bennett is located in Sandpoint, and here's a link to a page that explains some of the rules in more detail that she's going to go over in her presentation. After Danelle speaks, our next presenter is going to be Jessica Harold with Hen and Hair Micro Farm in Boise, Idaho. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And Danelle, I invite you to share your screen. And again, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A box and we will be able to answer those at the end of Danelle's presentation. And Danelle, right now you are muted. Okay, hello. Um, still kind of fumbling around, but I will get there. Not a problem. We always practice sharing screens before a presentation, but there's always something that seems to come up during one of our webinars. So we really appreciate everyone's patience. 
why Danelle gets her slides loaded. All right, how does that look? Is everyone able to view my slides? I am not seeing your slides yet. Oh, now I see them. Okay. Okay, yes. We see okay. them and they look great. Fantastic. Um, so welcome, I am Danelle Bennett. I'm the food safety coordinator for the Panhandle Health District located in Sandpoint, Idaho. Um, is everyone able to hear me okay? I will assume that yes, you can. Yes, absolutely, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, okay, so alongside with some of the exemptions and some of the navigating of what is exempt, what is actually licensed, um, this can be a little bit of a gray area. So I'm, you know, always available um, via email, phone call, if anybody has further detailed questions. Um, but one of the excellent things um, for small business in, in the state of Idaho is the cottage food exemption. Um, it, it essentially enables one to sell products created in a home style kitchen um, without the regulatory authority um, present. Uh, therefore, you know, it kind of takes some of the, the expenses um, of, of having a commercial kitchen um, and all the, the headaches and details that accompany that. Um, so a cottage food essentially is something that's produced in a, in a home setting um, that does not require refrigeration and is dry enough that it doesn't support microbiological growth. Um, it, it, or it may be acidic enough and that would be below a pH of 4.6 um, that the acidity of, of a particular food can inhibit that growth of microorganisms as well. Um, again, it's produced in an un unregulated kitchen um, and has to be sold directly to the consumer. Um, so, Kind of the, the caveat with this program is it's not something that you can produce in a home kitchen and then go statewide and all the super one grocers. Um, it doesn't really work that way. However, <clears throat> the state has been excellent at providing some, some venues for this. Um, you can essentially sell at you know any of the farmers markets you can actually create an online store and sell direct to the consumer in that regard um so <clears throat> as long as it is direct to consumer um you can figure out a creative way in which you can sell those products Um, the, the definitions through IDAPA um, is just a person or business preparing a cottage food or cottage food product in a home kitchen um, or other designated kitchen that may not be regulated um, through any of the health districts. Um, they are non time and temperature controlled for safety. So we often just refer to things as TCS, which is time and temperature controlled for safety. Um, they are sold directly to a consumer um, and our beautiful farmer's market um, at, in Sandpoint, Idaho, um, is full of some really amazing cottage food producers. Um, everything from jams and jellies to fruit pies, breads, cakes, pastries. Um, you can even flavor um, vinegars. Um, you can make your own dry herb mixtures. Um, there's a lot of different um, applications for this exemption. 
Um, so some things that are exempt from regulation are any harvest cut produce um, and then things that that really would not ever be exempt as far as produce is concerned are sprouts. Um, those are, that's a little bit of a riskier food. Um, so any alfalfa and bean sprouts that ac actually requires a license. And then anything that people would do with microgreens, um, let's say that, you know, you're going to harvest them, pulverize them, add them to a drink, um, that actually would require a license as well. Um, anything else, you know, as long as it's just the harvest cut, um, you have full ability to sell that direct to consumer, um, you know, at the venue of your choice. Um, some other things that are exempt are breads and cookies. Um, anything that wouldn't require refrigeration as far as, you know, breads and cookies are concerned um, and cakes as well. Jams and jellies. Um, one thing that is not included in that are any of the low sugar uh, jams or jellies. If you're going to do a sugar free, um, that actually does require a license. And it's the sugar that helps to inhibit microbiological growth that allows the exemption. Um, so then you can make granola, trail mixes, um, dried herbs and spices, and vinegar and flavored vinegars. And yes, there is the potential to make lemonade, limeade, things that are really acidic like that, um, even though it's, you know, preparing and cutting and squeezing lemons, they are so very acidic that they don't present a lot of public health concern. Um, so again, it's, it's just the harvest cut only um, produce that is exempt from this regulation. You couldn't, you know, like, wash mushrooms and slice them and um, prepare them for this exemption. That would actually require a license because um, we have concern with the plumbing um, that you would use in a produce style st sink for that. Um, so, it gets down to the very small detail. Um, so harvest cut, uh, unwashed it is a great um, thing. And I really enjoy uh, acquiring these items at the, at the local farm, farmer markets as well. Um, so baked goods, um, the common exemptions again are cookies, um, bread, pastries, candies, and confections. Um, well, freeze drying is extremely popular. Um, and we have a lot of producers that are just literally buying like candies off um, the, the, shore, the store shelves and then freeze drying them and reselling those. Um, so fruit pies, um, pumpkin pies, it's a little bit of a gray area. Some do require refrigeration and some do not. So we would just ask that a sample be sent to a lab. And I do have a list of those coming up um, on another slide um, in order to be exempt. Um, cakes are fine as long as they don't require refrigeration. It's usually the frosting that throw somebody, um, so, you know, for a loop when they're applying for an exemption. Um, cream cheese frosting is, you know, typically going to be a, a refrigerated item, um, as well as a large proportion of the buttercream frostings. Um, so as long as those are tested, sometimes they'll meet either a pH or a water activity test. Um, to exempt them from licensure. Um, 
So the water activity um, and pH tests are very inexpensive. Um, and it's not that you are required to submit every single batch. You're only required to um, do that one time. And then if you decide to change your recipe or add a, a new item that, that might fall in that gray area, then we would just kindly request that you provide another sample um, analysis to our health district. Um, and again, it's the 4.6 pH and the 0 0.85 water activity that we would be looking for. Um, so jams and jellies, again, with high sugar content, um, savory jams also um, are not part of this exemption. Um, tinctures, you just can't make a medicinal claim. I did actually have somebody submit a product um, that had a, a kind of a veiled um, title called frog in the throat. That there is nothing wrong with that. Everything else on the label doesn't make any medicinal claims. So you can also have creative license um, with your products, just as long as it's not making any medicinal claim or providing a dosage, um, you know, a, a, a dosage uh, detail on that label. Um, so again, dehydrated and freeze dried fruit has to meet the acidity requirements. Um, so melons, bananas, mangoes frequently are not acidic enough to, um, you know, qualify for the exemption. Veggies also a no on freeze dried veggies. Um, no meats. I get questions all the time whether or not beef jerky or any type of jerky can be considered a cottage food. It cannot. It is a specialized process that requires a HACCP plan um, and USDA inspected meat. Um, so that's kind of a kind of a disappointment to the community when they realize that it requires so many um, details to be documented. Um, and then no pickles. Um, we don't have, you know, pickled products as, as part of the exemption. Do they meet the acidity requirements? Yes. But acidifying foods when you're using um, you know, anything acidic such as vinegar to lower the pH of a food is actually considered a specialized process and um, requires licensure. Uh, here are some of the labs that I know perform the tests um, that, that, you know, if it falls in your item falls into a gray area, uh, essentially, we would just kindly request a sample. Now, these are not, this is not an exhaustive list. You are welcome to find any additional labs that perform specifically a pH or water activity test. Um, labels. Labeling is kind of a big deal. Um, we do get a little pushback. Um, we get a little bit of pushback from this um, because people find that the, some of their recipes are proprietary. We are not going to advertise your recipe. Um, we're not here to infringe on anyone's creative um, aspect, but we do have to know the ingredients so that we can assess them for safety. Um, so those would be essentially following any regular food I household item that you would have in your home. Um, you're going to list out the ingredients um, in the order of predominance. So the largest quantity of whatever the ingredient will be listed first down to the smallest content um, listed last. 
Um, in addition, major allergens do have to be declared. Um, the sesame is loosely in that, that category now. Um, so, um, you know, if you have anything that would have a sesame, it, it's better just to list it than to wonder. Um, so all the major allergens are listed on the bottom of this page. Um, and uh, we would just want to know what is it? How many or um, what is the weight of your product? And then always, you know, who are you? Where are you located? Um, so we need to know the name of your facility and city, state, and zip. Um, if there's any additional identifying information uh, that's required, your inspector or the person at your health district would assist you with that. Um, and then you have to just declare that, um, you know, this is made in an unregulated facility, um, that it may contain allergens and again, give people, um, you know, the, the ability to know what all the ingredients are. Um, food sensitivities seem to be escalating. Um, and there's a whole host of theories behind that, but we don't need to get into that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more allergies um, now than, than there used to be. Um, so it's really important to assist people with identifying what they're consuming. Um, and that is about all I have for you. Um, if there's any additional questions regarding processing or licensing, I can always be contacted directly um, to get you the information that you need to get started. Great. Thank you, Danelle. We do have a couple of questions that have come in. The first one is, are fruit syrups allowed under the cottage food rules? They can be. Um, it's really recommended. They may either meet water activity or um, the pH requirements. So it's really recommended just to test that um, to prove through a product assessment that that it does not require a license. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, are fermented foods exempt? No, they are not. Uh, fermented foods are um, also considered a specialized process. We would be controlling for Clostridium botulinum um, in the fermented foods, um, since a lot of that occurs in an anaerobic environment without oxygen. Um, so yeah, fermented foods um, is a specialized process, um, but we do have several licensed um, fermenters in our area, and I really enjoy working with them. Um, they've taught me quite a bit as well, so I always appreciate when I can learn about new processes and new foods that I might not be familiar with. And how about pumpkin bread and pepper-based jams and jellies? So pumpkin bread um, most often is going to meet the water activity requirement, but like say like pumpkin pie, really never know. Is it shelf stable or does it require refrigeration? Um, so we really do have to have the pies tested um, and then pepper jams. I mean, they could potentially get tested for pH to see if they meet. Um, but a lot of the times they are not going to meet that criteria, but we're always, you know, open to getting a new analysis and seeing. So 
we do whatever we can to kind of help the process and maybe help suggest other avenues that may work. Um, you know, if somebody was amazing at pepper jam and that was exactly what they wanted to do, I would do my best to, to help them get licensed in the least expensive way that they possibly could. Could you talk a little bit more about the licensing process and how people would find information about licensing for items that don't fall under the cottage food rules? Yes, and I'm more than happy to do that. Um, so number one, many of the applications and information can be found on our website um, at the Panhandle Health District. Uh, dot org. Um, we essentially um, have links to fillable PDF applications. Um, so there is a license for a mobile. Um, there's a license for a temp event and say, you know, I want to make hot dogs one night and sell them to the general public. Like we, you can do that. Um, there's a license for an, uh, a semi full establishment restaurant, a full establishment restaurant and a food processor. If you were, you know, taking things that you wanted to produce on your own in a commercial setting, that would be where, you know, the food processing license would come into play. And that allows you to essentially not only sell to third parties, but, um, you know, as long as we've got you completely compliant, you're able to sell across state lines with that license as well. Um, so, the applications sometimes can look slightly daunting. It is very specific to your facility. Um, and then what you, what is your process? What are you wanting to produce? What, you know, what are the items that you're cooking, et cetera? Um, so those are the applications and some of the types of licenses. In addition, um, we do um, have a, uh, regulation that was passed in 2018 that requires a certified food protection manager. And that credential is an eight hour um, training um, with an exam that is a five year certification for um, it is just the most intense food safety certification that you can get. Um, but that's required for full licensure. Um, in the entire state of Idaho and it nationally um, in probably 99% of the states. Thank you. Kind of moving away from maybe cooked or processed foods in that realm to, we have a couple of questions about things happening on the farm. So one attendee would like to confirm that they understand correctly that unwashed, not chopped greens like spinach, kale, lettuce, etc., fall under the cottage food law, but not washed or chopped greens. Correct. That is correct. Once you wash or chop a an item, especially produce, um, it, you know, it becomes a TCS food. Um, and that's through FDA testing, um, you know, years of research. Um, so yeah, anything unwashed and uncut is a cottage food. That is correct. Okay. And our final question for you, are there storage requirements for unwashed produce? I mean, we would want you to use common sense. But um, because we are exempting you from licensure, we have no regulatory authority at that point. Um, so we're really not um, 
privy to that information. But we, you know, I would assume that that most people will do so in the most safe manner they possibly can. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Danelle. And we will make sure that your slides are available on the website with the webinar recording. So thank You're you. You're welcome. Joining. You're welcome. I really enjoyed it and got a lot out of the other presenters as well. So thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. Our next presenter is Jessica Harold with Hen and Hair Micro Farm. So Jessica, we'll go ahead and switch right over to you and you can share your screen. Okay, is everything showing up all right? It is. Awesome. Uh, so my name is Jessica Harold, and I have Hen and Hair Micro Farm um, along with Apis in Boise, Idaho. We have just two acres, um, so we really have to make the most of what space we have in production. And um, that includes us incorporating a lot of uh, value-added foods um, and value-added products in general um, into what we offer. We are always looking to uh, sort of layer our enterprises and um, you know, using the entirety of our space and what we have available uh, to really stay profitable and to also have a diverse product line. What we um, have noticed is that uh, it's kind of our way of doing season extension. So when a lot of the produce farms at market aren't showing up anymore, we have um, still other products that we can bring. And so we can continue to be profitable the year round by always having a product to offer. Uh, so I'll go through an overview um, kind of of our farm as a whole and what we're selling and then talk more about our value added products. Uh, so as I chimed in with earlier, um, we also raise rabbits uh, for meat production. We do turkeys and we also have sheep and chickens on our farm. Um, so we are offering um, eggs in a really small capacity. Uh, we teach chicken processing classes with a lot of the chickens that we raise and um, we are also getting the wool milled. The sheep we keep for our own personal use, um, but we are incorporating some of their byproducts into what we're selling. Uh, we also have a lot of um, value added foods of what we're bringing to market, especially since we uh, just do turkeys very seasonally, and um, a lot of our rabbits are actually sold to restaurants. Uh, that way, we have uh, still a strong presence at market, and what we're using, um, you know, instead of bringing berries to market and, you know, worrying about picking at the right time and holding those in refrigeration, we just are canning and then selling throughout the year. Um, it helps us reduce our waste and unpredictability at market. Um, so we produce our jam and our seasoning salts under the cottage food um, law. And we also added strawberry vinegar this past year, um, which has been a really wonderful addition. Uh, the mustard we did offer um, and that we went through an entire certification course. I think it was offered through University of Idaho. They have really great resources where all of these classes um, are paid for through a grant. Um, so that was how we got that really high level of like food safety standard uh, that was mentioned earlier. Um, but what we found that was difficult is the um, just having the knowledgeable staff, we were working with a local production facility to um, use their commercial kitchen and also to rent out their staff by the hour as well. Um, just because getting into big commercial production was really intimidating for me. Um, just all of the regulations had completely different levels of equipment, you know, big 
mixing bowls that your entire body could fit into versus producing in a small commercial kitchen or a small home kitchen. Um, so having that staff was so helpful, but they are a very big business and it was hard for us to kind of get space in that kitchen and the timing since we were using um, products that we grew to incorporate into the mustard as well. Um, just that, that timing was tricky. So we've since discontinued that product just because we feel that the cottage food products, um, since we're producing them at our property, they um, fit more easily into our schedule and we don't have to worry about staffing or any um, anything else that might hinder or um, make the production more tricky, I guess. Um, so we have decided to stick um, with the cottage food products for now. And we are growing a lot of our ingredients um, for these products. So we grow the blackberries and a lot of the other fruits. Uh, some we do source from local farms as well, uh, things that we don't have the space for, just to add a little bit of diversity into what we can offer. And um, then we also do grow a lot of the herbs for those seasoning salt blends as well. And we're drying those and blending them here. Um, and we do have a few other uh, value added products that don't really fall under cottage food, but we do have a skincare line that I wanted to mention um, just because it is a great way if you have excess herbs that you um, have different ways to do, um, to create products versus putting them into a seasoning salt blend or a vinegar. Um, and we are growing our herbs for these products as well. And that's really helped us at farmer's market um, since we are considered, some farmer's markets have different regulations where they um, either want you to be using a lot of local products or what you're classified as too, if you're considered a farm or artisan. Um, for us at the Boise Farmer's Market, uh, we are considered a farm because we are growing a lot of the ingredients um, that go in here, which uh, just helps with our um, how we are at the market since they are trying to be a very farm focused market. And um, so we are growing and drying all of those herbs as well. And then talking about a little bit of our labeling, um, we have decided to invest in a lot of uh, outside help just with design and photography. Uh, we tried kind of to do it ourselves and it just never looked like how we wanted. And since we are very, you know, visual creatures and we like to see things that look really neat and put together, uh, we, it was really hard. <laughs> at first to spend so much money with um, hiring a photographer and a label designer. Um, but I think it was worth it. So you can see that we have our farm name and what the item is. And what we don't have pictured is the side of our jam labels that do have all of the other regulatory requirements like our name and the ingredients list. Um, but some things that we found that help with labeling too are to make them really bright, simple and bold labels and to use color to differentiate where, you know, you see the orange and you just know it's the peach jam, the purple is great. Um, it makes it a really eye-catching display at market and it helps just um, with customer recognition of a product as well. And uh, we've also um, received some really good advice with how um, our products are labeled, especially with the skincare line. When we were first getting um, into the co-op, we were buying just the basic Avery paper labels. And I received some really great advice that um, it just, it looked too homemade. And for us, we found that there's a really fine line between some people really want that homemade look. Um, but then some people, they don't give it enough credit where then they want to go with a product that looks more um, 
commercial. So we have um, just a vinyl uh, label. So it, it also doesn't get water damage, which has been really valuable, especially at farmer's market where before those paper labels, if they got wet, the entire product was just kind of ruined. We had to scrap it because the label looked bad. So having that waterproof um, vinyl label has helped a lot um, just for overall quality. Um, they make us look a bit more professional and um, just kind of like a cleaner look overall. And we have a really great designer that we work with. And um, so we have a set price where we pay a certain amount per label. I think it's around 40 or $50, which in the long run, um, the amount of time that you're saving, trying to like meet all of these uh, labeling standards and to make it look really nice. Um, it, we did find that it was actually really worth it. Um, and yeah, then getting a photographer on board. Um, there are some really great photographers who can be really affordable and they will give you a ton of photos, which does help in the long run too, for if you are posting continually on social media or your website, um, just having those photos instead of having to take that time, uh, we found really cost effective for us as well. And then we do have different regulations that I just wanted to point out. If we are doing skincare products, um, these labels for skincare are regulated by the FDA, including different um, font sizes, what everything needs to have, contact information. And we found that it was really helpful then with working with the designer um, where we just sent over the full list of regulations and they ensured that everything was done, including that um, type font size. So uh, just to point out that our um, mustard labels and beauty labels definitely had certain regulations that they had to meet, more complicated regulations. Um, overall, very similar to cottage food, but there was definitely a different um, layer where cottage food did have some more uh, relaxed standards. And I am open for any questions if you guys have any. Wow, thanks for that great presentation. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, yesterday we talked about labels and voluntary certifications. Is that anything, do you have any types of labeling like part of Idaho Preferred or other types of certification programs that you found important to your business? Um, I recently just joined Idaho Preferred, so I haven't thought about adding that um, onto my labels yet. If anything, I might add a sticker when I'm sending products out to Idaho businesses. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to expand some of my wholesale with the beauty products across state lines where I don't think Idaho Preferred would have the same kind of impact as it does here locally. So. I think that just for the flexibility of it, I would leave off um, state-based certifications like that and just be able to add it on just for the simplicity of um, where if I was out of one type of label stuff or the other, like just for product flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, just my own personal preference and also based on if you only want to sell in Idaho or if regulations allow you to only sell in Idaho. Um, uh, just, yeah. <laughs> right, there's <laughs> a lot of things for me. Right, a lot of different things to consider. Yes. And, and in terms of working with a photographer, mm -hmm. are there any suggestions you have for somebody who might be wanting to interview a photographer or a designer? to make sure that they're a good fit for working with them in their operation, especially in light of some of the things that you just said, like with your um, beauty care products that are regulated by FDA, that those are things that have specific font sizes and other types of details. Oh, a photographer or a designer to clarify? Um, I think both, like when you're working with a photographer and then when you move to work with a designer. Oh, sure. Um, so for getting my labels designed with like graphic designer, um, there are a lot of designers out there who do have experience um, very specifically in food labeling, which is really helpful. 
Um, but if they don't, like my previous designer um, had a ton of food labeling and beauty product labeling, labeling experience. And when I decided to rebrand my product, um, my new designer didn't. So I then had to become really well versed, um, which was intimidating, but FDA does have everything very spelled out in their guidelines. So what I did was just create a checklist for the both of us to go over um, just before final approval on the products uh, to make sure that everything was um, above board and met regulations. Um, so it sounds super intimidating overall, though, it was a really manageable um, process. Uh, I just had to be, I had to know more instead of kind of hiring that out. And when I um, then was looking for product photographers, a lot of it was uh, recommendations or Instagram, honestly, was following other businesses that I um, liked their product photography and asked them who they were using. And then um, just kind of seeing uh, some photographers will give you the entire, basically their entire card, like uh, SD card or storage card of photos that they take. Um, and having a photographer that will just give you all of the photos has been helpful, or at least, you know, a large portion of them. They won't give you tons of bad photos and tons of repeat photos, but it's been really valuable having like um, similar but different pictures to be able to use across my Instagram or across my website that have um, a little bit of a different look, um, but they're overall pretty similar, so it doesn't feel like I'm completely recycling photos all the time. So just uh, going into it with knowing the cost and um, giving them all of the products at once so they can batch their time is really helpful. You're more likely to get a better deal that way. And then um, knowing what to expect, how many photos you expect to get back. And uh, I think the price difference between me getting just I don't know, 30 photos versus the entire stash of photos was $100. And that $100 is like 100% worth it. Great. Thank you. That's really great advice about both the designer and the photographer. We really appreciate your presenting today, Jessica. Thank you so much. We don't have any other questions that have come okay. in. And so I think I will wrap up our webinar by again, thanking all of our presenters today, letting you know that we would love your feedback about this webinar and a short evaluation, really it only takes two to three minutes is going to launch immediately following the webinar. And then tomorrow you will also receive by email, a link to the webinar evaluation and a link to watch the recorded webinars from this season. We thank you for participating in this season's webinar series. And we wanted to also let you know that we're in the process of creating a new guide for farm direct marketing in Idaho. We're doing this in, in collaboration with the Idaho State Department of Agriculture. The guide is being funded by a USDA beginning farmer rancher project. And we will have printed versions of the guide available in August. So if you're watching this webinar live, you will automatically receive information about um, how you can sign up to get a printed copy of the guide mailed to you. If you are watching a recording of this webinar, please go to the Cultivating Success website and sign up for our e-newsletter. When that guide is available, we will send out an announcement again on how you can sign up to have a copy mailed to you. We will have an electronic copy also available from the Cultivating Success website. Thanks again for joining us today to both our fabulous presenters and to our audience. We wish you well and hope to see you on another Cultivating Success program soon.